Thank you for clicking that link. Color Me Crypto, Episode 3, Protecting Your Bitcoin. It is May 12th at the time of this recording. This is some valuable information. Very quick video, hopefully. I'm going to try to keep it a little shorter than uh, the video so far have been. But uh, thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't. And also consider visiting that Patreon and signing up for a subscription. Thank you. Much love. Let's go. First things first, contact information adamantineblade at protonmail.com and the Discord server. That link will also be in the description. Feel free to copy and paste that into your browser. You do not need to sign up to join in the server and just chat amongst uh, people who want to learn about cryptocurrency as well. Lastly, before starting, do consider donating cash at PayPal Venmo. If you find the video informative, come back to this screen and just scan the QR codes and make a donation, whatever you see fit. It is appreciated and you will get shouted out in the next video. Much love. Let's go. This video is for informational purposes only. Nothing presented herein constitutes financial advice. No person or entity associated with this production received payment or anything of value or entered into any agreement in connection with the depiction of software, products, services, or trading platforms. All views expressed are solely those of the channel unless explicitly stated otherwise. Viewers should seek counsel from a financial advisor prior to making any investments. Investing without proper planning or research can result in a complete loss of funds. Today, we're talking about how to protect your Bitcoin. Bitcoin, I'll use that term loosely. This applies broadly to any cryptocurrency, but because Bitcoin is the gold standard of digital currency, we're talking about Bitcoin specifically, but you can apply these principles and ideas to other coins in your possession. First and foremost, strong passwords. You want to set strong passwords. When you reuse passwords, you become vulnerable to what are called password stuffing attacks. So basically what password stuffing is, Say a hacker gets your Hotmail login, 123 at hotmail.com or whatever, and your password is ABC. If you use that same email and same password on Facebook, they can perform what is called a password stuffing attack, where they will take those same credentials from Hotmail and stuff them into Facebook and be able to log in. And that can all be avoided, mitigated, stopped completely if you just do not reuse passwords. If you have a lot of exchange accounts, a lot of accounts in general, you will want a password manager to help you keep track of them. And I have KeyPass XC on the screen. We'll talk more about that later. Device encryption. Encrypt your device. It protects in the event of theft. On the screen, we have BitLocker and VeraCrypt. BitLocker is only on some versions of Windows. I believe it's the Pro version, but you can pay for it separately if you're on Windows. But a free alternative, which we'll talk more about later, is Veracrypt. Veracrypt is free and because you use one doesn't necessarily mean you can't use the other. You can use them in conjunction with one another for improved security. And encryption simply means data on your device cannot be retrieved if it is stolen. Once you unlock your device and it's on, it's unencrypted, but once you power it off, unless they know the password, they cannot access your files or your money, your login, whatever. You want to enable all available security features underneath. We have some examples. Some of them, I'm sure you already know what they are. 2FA, whitelist, phishing codes, and IP binding. 2FA is just when you log into your account and you get like a little extra email or a text message saying, hey, here's a code. Do you want to log in? Yes or no? That's 2FA, two-factor authentication. A whitelist or address book, that is a very powerful feature. It lets someone... Say someone hacks into your Coinbase account or someone hacks into any exchange you're on. If you have an address book set up, they cannot withdraw to any address that is not on your address book. So basically, they could log in and play around in your account, but they cannot steal money from your account because the address that they would like to withdraw to is not in your address book or your whitelist. A phishing code uh, that's very simple but powerful feature when you sign up to account they might ask you to set a phishing code so a phishing code would be a spe specific number that you set up yourself say my phishing code is one one two two three three 
if I get an email from Binance about my account or anything related to Binance, in that email it will have the numbers 112233. If I see an email from Binance that does not have those numbers in the message, I already know it's a phishing scam. We're going to talk about what phishing is later. And IP binding, that's very simple. It just keeps track of your IP address that you log in from and will send some type of flag or alert if you're logging in from some crazy address. Say you're logging in from Texas. If they see a login from China, they probably are going to prevent that login. That's IP binding. And safe online practices. You want to ensure HTTPS is enabled. You don't want to enter your card information on shady websites. And you always want to download from legitimate sources, AKA official software. Do not try to get it for the low, low. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. So we know what phishing codes are. Let's talk about phishing. When you're the victim of a phishing attack or a phishing scam, someone basically impersonated an authoritative figure and got you to reveal sensitive information about yourself. So phishing is tricking someone into revealing sensitive information by posing as a reputable company or individual. We've already seen them. That's the, the famous Nigerian scam or your account's been hacked. We to secure your funds, input your password and your address and blah, blah, blah. Those are phishing scams. Nine times out of 10, you will not get a direct call from your credit card company or your bank. So according to the FBI, phishing was the most common type of cyber crime in 2020. Phishing incidents nearly doubled in frequency between 2019 and 2020. And basically from 2016 to 2020, phishing attacks, phishing complaints rose up 11 times over. So there were 11 times more phishing complaints in 2020 than in 2016. And we have a graph that I'm going to show you right now. So if you ever get one of those calls and you are worried that your account is in danger, just call the official support line yourself. Look on Google, look on your bank statement, whatever, find a official support line number and call that number directly. And that will clear up any miscommunication that you have about the status of your account. So now on the screen, I have two graphs just to help illustrate and reiterate how wary you as a new cryptocurrency holder need to be wary of phishing. So on the left, it's just showing that phishing sites over time have basically replaced malware sites as the leading, the leading attack vector that hackers and scammers try to use. It used to be malware and now it's phishing because human error, like most security systems, the weakest point is the user the human the person who is sitting at the desk so phishing attempts target the user and on the right hand side it's just showing with the whole pandemic the coronavirus thing going on it's showing you the amount of domains which are websites that have risen in response to covid that's just saying maybe if you put x y and z into this form your address your name your social you'll be on the expedited list to receive the vaccine things of that nature or we have the covid19 vaccine for the low if you input your credit card information we'll send it to you asap probably things of that nature i've never been on any coronavirus scam websites but that's just showing that phishing is the primary method that people will try to use to steal your information so you need to be wary you need to not be so hasty and click every link you see because we're talking about protecting our investment, protecting our coins, we need to understand what it is and what it isn't. First, Bitcoin is not a stock. There are terms that apply to Bitcoin or that have been applied to cryptocurrency that also can be applied to stocks, but cryptocurrency and stocks are not the same thing. Bitcoin is not a get rich quick scheme. A lot of the people who you're hearing are Bitcoin millionaires or Bitcoin billionaires or crypto, whatever. They had those coins when they weren't worth anything. They hold it. They held on for their life. They hodled. And that's how they amassed that money because the value of certain coins has just shot up exponentially. It's not a get rich quick scheme. 
Bitcoin is not anonymous. It is swaydonymous. All of your transactions are public. The address might not be linked to you, which we'll talk more about later, but it is swaydonymous. It is public, therefore it can be traced and if someone is skilled enough, it can be tracked back to you. You do not need a full Bitcoin to get started. This is a extremely common misconception. You do not need to own a whole Bitcoin to start investing. You can earn shares or own shares of a Bitcoin with the smallest denomination being a Satoshi. So lastly, you do not own any crypto you purchase on Robinhood, etc., etc. You own crypto when you control the private key. It becomes yours once you transfer it to a non-custodial wallet. I hope you watched some of the earlier videos. I'm not really going to talk about that, but let's go. So anonymity slash privacy, breaking traceability. The easiest way to protect our coins is going to be making it so that no one knows we even have any. Do not reuse addresses. Remember, every transaction is public. Because it is publicly viewable, anyone can go to literally Google and look up your transactions. So if you use an uh, address only once, that basically stops them cold turkey because they can only find information for that one address. You see what I'm saying? Use multiple wallets for different purposes. Again, you do that as, as well as not reusing addresses. You are making it extremely difficult for someone to rebuild your transaction history and see how much Bitcoin you are spending or receiving. Consider hiding your IP address. When you spend cryptocurrency, although it isn't tied to an IP address, someone who is, say you have a hacker or a man in the middle on your network or you're using public Wi-Fi that someone is snooping around on, if they see you doing a DNS search for Coinbase.com or any other exchange, they can say, hmm, maybe this person has some cryptocurrency and they see you keep going out to different cryptocurrency sites, cryptocurrency this, cryptocurrency that. They'll say, oh, this person at this IP address, they have cryptocurrency. Maybe I could, you know, hack their computer, get some of that for myself. So you want to consider hiding your IP. We'll talk about how to do that. Some easy tools. And lastly, coin mixers slash tumblers. This is a little pricey i guess i've never used them personally but the concept is this say i'm a and i want to send cryptocurrency to b what a coin mixer does is it will take coins from other people say c d e f g it'll take coins from all of us put it in a pool and it will redistribute those coins out so that the intended recipient and the original sender are unknown so if I'm trying to send five Bitcoin to B and I use a coin mixer, what it'll do, it'll take, say, one Bitcoin from this person, one Bitcoin from that person, one Bitcoin from another person until it gets five. And then it will send that to B. You see what I'm saying? So it's basically taking different address inputs and tricking someone who's potentially trying to view your transactions into thinking you didn't even send money to, to this person. You sent money to that person, which is not the case. That's a coin mixer. And the mask is a great icon for that because it's literally masking your transactions. So let's keep continuing on. So here are some wallets that from my research I saw got praised for their privacy. I left a few others out. Obviously, if you want, you can always look more into this. But here are some I've put in. Electrum Wallet. I've used this one personally. It's very easy for beginners. And you can literally lose your wallet a hundred times. Your computer can get destroyed a hundred times. But as long as you have that seed phrase, you are set. And Electrum by default will generate a new address for you each time. And once it stops doing that, I believe it stops generating new addresses for you. You can simply generate them manually. So that's very cool about Electrum. I love this program. I, I don't use it anymore, but I will always vouch for it. Second, we got Samurai Wallet. I've never used it, but I have read great things about it. It's on Android. I believe it is also on iOS, but do not quote me. And it has a built in coin mixer and several other security features. When I was reading the security features for Samurai Wallet, it literally just seemed jammed packed with security features. Some 
really cool stuff if you if you have an android like me and you want to hold your cryptocurrency on a phone for quick transactions on the go buying selling on the go things like that do consider checking out samurai wallet and lastly the ledger nano series that would be the ledger nano s and the ledger nano x i'm surprised i didn't see trezor on the list when i was looking them up looking up anonymous slash private wallets but these three here if you start here you're good only thing I will say is Ledger Nano series is not free. It's a hardware wallet, so you will have to spend some money on it. But what is a little 50 or however much dollars a cheap one cost to your, your money? Also, I will say this for a hardware wallet, never buy a used one. You want to buy a hardware wallet brand spanking new. You want to see the tamper seal on that thing. Do not use a. Anyway, that's enough on that. Do not use. A hardware wallet unless it's brand new out the box straight from the factory straight straight from the supplier that's all i have to say on that your loss if you get a used one and your money gets stolen so we want to mask our ip address now we've picked a wallet with amazing security features but we want to go a step further keep in mind this is not a necessity you do not need to do this this is just if you want to go above and beyond and just have peace of mind that no one knows what you're doing with your money that's all this is about it's not about shady business it's not about whatever you think it is it's just you it's your privacy it's your business it's no one else's and you're taking the steps necessary to protect yourself and your coins so let's go ip stands for internet protocol all devices connected to the internet are assigned an ip so if i take my cell phone and I'm disconnected from Wi-Fi, I'm not on carrier or 4G or whatever, I do not have an IP address. The minute my cell phone connects to a hotspot, it is given an IP address. So you just need to know that. IP address is tied to your ISP, your identity by proxy through your ISP. That's not the case on public Wi-Fi though. That's not the case on public Wi-Fi. That's like say, um, you were looking up how to make bombs or some stupid shit like that and you make a bomb and you blow up some building the law enforcement can contact your isp or go through your isp and find logs of your records and your ip address is also tied to your approximate geographic location so we're spending bitcoin we're buying here we're buying there how do we hide our ip address some ip address obfuscation tools brave we talked about that in episode two um, how to make literally free money. We talked about Brave. It has Tor built in. Tor stands for the Onion Router. It was developed by the Navy and it's basically a series of nodes, computers, that encrypt your connection before forwarding it along to the internet and make it very hard for someone to basically see what you're browsing. Um, VPNs, I have NordVPN on the screen, but there are thousands of other VPNs. It stands for Virtual Private Network. That will give you a brand new IP address. Similar to Tor, uh, it, they just do it through different mechanisms. And then um, on the bottom, some people might know about this. It's called I2P. It's pretty cool. It's not as active as Tor. If you're looking for speed and super, super anonymity, I would say Tor. Even though Tor will slow your connection down con compared to I2P, Tor is way better. VPNs, way better than Tor, but the level of security isn't as high so it all just comes down to what you're willing to trade off what you want but again it's just about more security hiding that you're even using bitcoin in the first place because when you connect to a node and broadcast a transaction it will know your ip address it will see the ip address you are connecting from so you need to keep that in mind if you don't want that information known to whoever you're sending your transactions to you do want to consider hiding your IP address. And these are just some tools that you can use to accomplish that. So now on the screen, we have two screenshots. One is from Bitcoin Core. The other is from the Trezor web interface. I believe that's Trezor IO and they got a Trezor Model T, looks pretty cool. And it says fresh address on the bottom. If you see on the bottom underneath receive Bitcoin, it says fresh address. Trezor literally generates a new address for you with each transaction. It's up to you whether or not you want to reuse, but that's just creating new addresses, anonymity. And then on the top, 
you can literally request payments using Bitcoin Core or any other wallet for that matter, and it will spit out a new address for you. But that's not to say you cannot reuse addresses. We're talking about anonymity slash privacy, though. So we do suggest you create a new address. So now to sum all that up, you want to avoid reusing addresses. You want to use a non-custodial wallet because that way you own the private key. You want to connect via proxy or VPN with a no logs policy. This is hiding your IP address, masking your internet protocol address, which is ultimately masking your location. You want to run a full node because if you run a full node yourself, you're not even broadcasting your IP to get a transaction validated because you have a copy of the blockchain that is increasing your privacy. And lastly, you want to try using decentralized exchanges. I didn't touch much on those because it's a little involved and I'm still learning a lot about decentralized exchanges, but basically they run on smart contracts across several different computers. There is no one single centralized server that they run on, but we'll talk more about that at a later date. So we know all the tools now. We are using a coin mixer. We're running a full node. We're hiding our IP address with a VPN. We're doing this and that. We're using a new address every single time. Well, guess what? There's limits. Most online exchanges only give users one address per coin. So if I'm on Coinbase, this is the perfect example. If I'm on Coinbase and I'm doing transactions with Ethereum, Monero, sorry, not Monero, Ethereum, Bitcoin and Litecoin. Basically, Coinbase is only giving me one address for each of those coins. It's not going to give me the option to even create a new address. So having one address makes it easier for a third party to monitor your transaction history slash spending habits that ties into that you're required by law, according to the IRS, to report your cryptocurrency gains and losses. So basically, you'll get a 1099K form, I believe, for from each exchange you're on that is tied to your identity and whatnot, and it shows your whole transaction history. And it just makes it 10 times easier for the exchange to do that if they give you only one address. So the fifth anti-money laundering directive, AMLD5, requires that online exchanges collect personally identifiable information from their customers. These are referred to as KYC checks, know your customer. Exchanges, sorry, exchange addresses are automatically linked to your real identity. So it can be inferred that withdrawal addresses are also yours. And all that is saying that, so I have one address on Coinbase, but I withdraw it to my private wallet. Someone who sees that on the other end could say, oh, he had X, Y, and Z. He had $500. He had $50,000 in his Coinbase and he moved it to that address. He probably owns that address too. You see what I'm saying? So it can be inferred that the withdrawal address is also yours. It's not necessarily true, but chances are it's your address as well. That's how a blockchain analyst would look at it at least. We already covered how to be anonymous, how to stop people from tracing you, or at least make it very difficult for someone to try to trace you and your transactions. Now we wanna secure our assets digitally. It's very simple, very straightforward. We don't want to reuse passwords. Again, your password is going to be your best line of defense. Use a good password. Do not use a weak password like 123 Lakers fan or something like that. Use a good password. You want to have a password manager. That green icon there with the key in it, that is KeePass XC logo. Go to their website, download KeePass XC. It's free. It's easy to use, easy to set up. It'll help you even generate random passwords that you can just copy and paste later how you feel. You want to back up your seed and important data, encrypt and copy it to external storage regularly, encrypt and then upload to cloud storage, i.e. Dropbox. Uh, that's just if you want to go above and beyond and you want to just have as much backup backups sorry, as possible so you can always upload to Dropbox. But personally, I just use an external hard drive. I'll make several copies after encrypting it, put it on an external hard drive and store my seeds that way. And lastly, 
avoid logging into sensitive accounts on public machines so if i'm on the library the library computer i'm not gonna log into my gmail my paypal my amazon i'm gonna maybe log into facebook or something make a little post real quick and log right out you want to clear your browser history when done clear the cache clear all of that sometimes though if you're on a public machine they won't let you clear it so what you can try is see if you can use incognito mode and that will prevent any of your information that you enter during your session from even being saved on the device so again you don't want to reuse passwords you want to back up your important information so remember your seed you will always write it down on paper but you will also want a digital copy that has been encrypted i say encrypted because you don't just want it sitting on your desktop as bitcoin seed dot txt that is the easiest way to get your money stolen someone can literally just take that file steal it if you encrypt it at the very least they will have to work to get that seed you see what i'm saying and then lastly you just don't want to log in on any old machine into every single account you own physical security is the other half of the story we already covered digital so physical is just as it sounds how you protect your actual device whether it be your laptop or your cell phone, just have laptop security cable on the screen. Again, this isn't a requirement. It's just if you want to take that extra step. You see what I'm saying? It's, none of this is requirements. It's just if you want to make it a lot harder for a thief or whoever to take your money, you want to just take extra measures. That's all, that is, that's all this is about. And second, full disk encryption. We talked about BitLocker and VeraCrypt earlier. But basically, it will protect your data if your device gets stolen. So if I take someone's laptop or someone steals my laptop and they try to hook it into their setup and cipher data off of it, it's impossible because the data is literally garbled up until it gets that correct password, which only you, the owner, would know. That's full disk encryption. It's stronger than a password because with a password, you're just protecting the data. With full disk encryption or with uh, file encryption, what you're doing is you're literally scrambling up the data that's in there and making it inaccessible. It's only accessible once someone authenticates with a password. And again, the most popular BitLocker for Windows, I believe it's Windows Pro. Don't quote me, but I think it's Windows Pro and then VeraCrypt. So if you have the money and you're on a Windows, you can try BitLocker, but VeraCrypt is free and it does a great job and you can actually use them both together so you want to just find a way to secure your device make sure it doesn't move where you don't want it to move maybe just invest in a little laptop security cable make sure your laptop can actually support one and then lastly you want to encrypt your device actually i should say you want to encrypt your device first and then worry about getting a cable for it but make sure you encrypt your device preferably the entire drive or you can just set up what is called an encrypted file container. So physical security, those are the two easiest things you can do. So now let's just bring everything together, what we can, what we can't control. We can control our home network, what router, what firewall, the computer, antivirus, all of that, we control that. We can secure our home, we can lock the front door, we can close the windows, we can do X, Y, and Z at nighttime, we can secure our home, we can put locks, we can do all types of things. We control that. We control our private key and its backups. We always write it down on paper, always. That is not up for debate. If you write your C down on paper, you are winning half the battle right there. You wanna create a digital copy and encrypt it. In the event that you're not storing your physical copy on paper securely, if you at least have a digital copy that's encrypted, that is an extra layer of defense in case your device gets lost. And you always want to move it to an external device because it makes no sense to hold that digital copy on the device that it's supposed to be protecting. You want to move it to a USB drive or something like that. We control what exchange we use and we control whether or not we give others our address. So that's not to say you, you're not doing something that maybe you will need to publicize your address. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying if you're not doing something like that, it makes no sense to tell people what your addresses are. And you can always control what exchange you use. That's probably one of the biggest decisions you'll have to make. What exchange will you use? Where will you buy cryptocurrency? And then 
They're just things you cannot control, so it makes no sense to worry about them. You can't control your home network being hacked. You can, again, you can control the router and the firewall and all that to make it harder, but you can't control if someone targets you and hacks you. You can't control theft or burglary. You can't just tell the burglar, hey man, don't rob me. That's not how that works. You cannot control that. Don't worry about things like that. You cannot control the private keys on an exchange. Therefore, you do not own the cryptocurrency on an exchange. So you always want to take your coins from exchange wherever you bought it. Coinbase, Nexo, Binance, um, Kraken, whatever. You want to move those to your personal wallet that you have the private key, you, that you have the seed. Remember, you wrote the seed down on a piece of paper. You want to move your coins from the exchange to your private wallet. And lastly, you can't control whether an exchange has been hacked. That is a big deal. Exchanges are arguably one of the biggest targets for hackers these days because they know how much money cryptocurrency, how much money circulates around cryptocurrency. Why not attack the source? It is one single point of failure, an exchange. It's centralized. So if they attack the exchange, guess what? They have access to everyone's funds. So you, can, you cannot control that. You just want to make sure the exchange you're on offers insurance. So if you're holding a significant amount of money on there, you need to know it's insured in some type of way. So that's pretty much the video. I really appreciate y'all watching. Go back, pause some of those still shots and just see what can you do, what works for you, maybe what doesn't work for you, and just keep your money safe. Thank you for watching the video. Much love. Peace.